are their temperaments starting to um, be solid and we know what it's gonna be because all along two years of age, it can really fluctuate. Um, and so we, we kind of wait for around one and a half to two to decide who they're gonna be placed with, what kind of personality they have and such. So yeah, Cooper, usually about a year and a half is when they start being trained to the, do their advanced skill. Um, as you can imagine, those of you who have been around puppies, they're pretty energetic, right? So if I'm trying to teach a puppy to hold something without biting it, well, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, we'd get a lot of chomping. So it's nice when we start training the uh, more detailed behaviors, uh, it, uh, uh, it's much easier to do because they're not in that chomping mouthy stage. So uh, we'll have Cooper do, oh, button. So, yeah. Cooper, here. All right, so another task that our mobility assistance dogs do is um, finding and hitting automatic door buttons. So, right, we're waiting to, to give Cooper the cue here. Sit. Good boy. <laughs> All right, Cooper. Button. Yes. <laughs> and we really want him to find that the middle of the button there. He, he kind of hit to the side, and then he said, oh, wait, that wasn't quite right. So I'm going to see if he'll do it again. Button. Yes, good boy, awesome. All right, and then on the back side, so Cooper's just learning to do um, light switches. So we'll see how he does. I don't want him to get too frustrated trying to do it up here, but we can try. We'll, we, maybe we'll work through the training process. Do you, are you guys curious of that? Okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll take one yes even. Um, okay, so, yep, yes. And usually the light comes on, but I think it just burned out. <laughs> yes, good boy. So I'm marking and rewarding anytime he's putting his mouth and his front teeth on that little switch. Yes, that's doing great, buddy. You do downwards. Yes, good boy. And one more. Good boy, nice job. Cooper's a lot faster than I am. Um, and the timing of our mark is very important. Dogs are super clever in that um, they could be doing the, the tiniest little detailed behavior and if I mark too early or too late, they will remember that behavior that they just done. So being a trainer entails being very timely in how we mark. Um, some dogs are more forgiving than others, but dogs like Cooper who are kind of border collie-esque, like give me more to do, give me more to do, and always want to be 10 steps ahead. Timing is very important when I say that Y-E-S word. So um, while well, I'm up here, any training questions? I think we can, or do you want to do, we can take, I don't know, no? Yeah. None? Okay. So we had a lot of questions about um, service dog access, and there is some confusion. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about emotional comfort animals. And we see this in the media, right? We see the peacock at the airport and the boa constrictor um, in housing. And what I can tell you is under federal housing guidelines, any animal can be an emotional comfort animal. And what emotional comfort animal means is that it provides comfort, okay? A service dog is individually trained to help a person with a disability by intervening with their disability. So like Theo, for me, provides balance. Uh, I don't see steps when I go down very well, and so he, Lindy trained him to take a step at a time so I can feel how far down he goes. So he's actively doing something that has to do with my disability. Now, if I have like panic disorder, anxiety disorder, PTSD, and I have Theo and he's not trained as a service dog, but he helps me because in my panic attacks, I can reach out and touch him and I, I calm down. 
that's still an emotional comfort animal. What makes a psychiatric service dog is the dog will do something. Like when I start amping up with my anxiety, if I have PTSD, my dog might be trained to come over and nudge me as kind of a, hey you, you need to take a break. Or my dog might be trained that when I'm in a crowd like this, uh, to get in between me and other people. Um, just subtly, you wouldn't even probably know what my dog was doing, but my dog is doing things that intervene to help me. So that's what a service dog is. And all service dogs are socialized and trained from a very young age to be in public and to face different situations. Why we worry about animals having um, service dog vests on and going into places when they're not trained is because when I walk through the grocery store and I have Theo beside me and someone's personal pet that is a, a comfort animal lunges at him or gets excited and wants to play with him, it impedes my ability to just do my grocery shopping. That's all I want to do. Um, and also I've seen uh, a lot of dogs who are in service dog gear who are getting overwhelmed. So, you know, there's a group of kids and they're all excited and they're all reaching for Fido and, you know, I love you, I want to pet you, and Fido gets nervous and growls, okay? That's a problem. So that's why we really encourage people to not misrepresent their animal as a service animal. Um, it's kinder to the pet. And it also makes my job, your job, walking through our world with our service dogs easier and more predictable. Um, but they are protected in housing and you can take comfort animals on airlines. Um, those are two federal groups that don't follow follow fully the Americans with Disabilities Act in the same way. Do you guys have any questions about, yeah. 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 You would think, right? So that's why you're all here, because you're going to help us get the word out, because there are psychiatric service dogs. And the only difference, like I said, is that these dogs are socialized and trained to go out with you in public and face whatever it is you're going to face, and they intervene. So the emotional comfort dog, you can let this person know if you still see them, that, uh, okay, good choice. Um, anyway. It, what I say, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to emotional comfort animals, but an emotional comfort animal, if a teddy bear can do it, it's a comfort animal in the sense if, it, if you can grab it, hug it, and it makes you feel better, but it doesn't do something with you to intervene, that's a comfort animal. If a dog is trained or a miniature horse is trained to intervene as your symptoms are starting or to wake you from a dream, that's a service animal. So y you would think a doctor would know that, but it's just, yeah, well, so. Yes, I spread the word. Yes, okay, thank you. So uh, that was a request to say what the questions were. So uh, we had a, a, that was in response to asking a question about a psychiatrist who told this person that um, wanting a service dog was actually the same as wanting an emotional comfort animal for PTSD, which is not true. So, any other questions with emotional comfort dogs, animals, service dogs? Okay, are there certain certifications to become a trainer? I'm going to let Lindy handle that. To become a dog trainer in general, it's widely um, uh, kind of a free-for-all right now. So I do have, personally, I have a certification. There's a Northwest School of Canine Studies, um, and I also have a background in animal behavior. Um, and so that's just my personal background, but pretty much anybody can wake up one day and say, I'm a dog trainer today, and I'm going to start taking clients. So really, it's up to everybody 
um, if you have a dog or looking for a trainer or looking for a trainer who trains service dog, really research their background, what kind of methods they use, and definitely ask them um, how they go about training and make sure you're comfortable with that training and them handling your dog because um, people can just gather information off of YouTube and um, say, again, they're just a dog trainer. So really, um, we're, there's more governing bodies trying to do pet dog certification and there are schools to learn to become a service dog trainer as well. I never went to service dog training um, particularly, uh, but I had mentors that helped me learn to do service dog training. Um, but I did start off in the pet dog world um, with a certification through Northwest School of Canine Studies. So um, in short, <laughs> there's you, you can just be a trainer one day if you want to, but um, as a person who trains service dogs professionally, um, it is the bar is set very high and there's a lot of risk involved, right? So if I didn't train the behaviors very, very well, it could um, really do damage to a client or um, even um, any anybody. So, um, yeah, just do a lot of do a lot of work and research and. Um, nope. I will interject. There is a group that I'd encourage anyone who's interested in in this information. Assistance Dogs International is an accrediting body. Um, for guide dog programs, service dog programs of all kinds. And we are accredited with them. And to be accredited means that our trainers, such as Lindy, um, meet certain expectations as far as their professionalism, their hours, how they train the dogs, how they interact with clients, all of that. And at that Assistance Dogs International, if you go there, you'll see standards and ethics that they set for the dogs. They want to make sure all service dogs out and about meet certain guidelines. They want to make sure that all clients are treated in certain ways. They want to make sure that trainers behave in a certain way um, and meet certain standards with their dogs in training. Um, you would think that there would be more criteria around how people train, and there's not at this time. So as Lindy said, we use positive reinforcement. Not all agencies do. We also place our service dogs at no charge. Not all agencies do, nor are they required to by Assistance Dogs International. So it's a real um, variance that you'll see, but there are certain standards and ethics that the dogs have to meet to be called the service dog if you're accredited. So, any? What have you always wanted to know? Yeah. So, okay, so let me know if I say this correctly, okay? So the question is, do you have to have a letter from either a doctor of physical medicine or a therapist or psychiatrist to have a service dog and to call it a service dog? Is that correct? So, uh, no. Um, when you have an emotional comfort animal in housing, they do ask for some kind of documentation. Um, to have a service dog, if I self-train my service dog, I don't have to have anything. If I go to Summit Assistance Dogs, they screen. And to get a service dog at Summit, I, my doctors have written in things about my disabilities, um, whether they think I can physically handle a dog, uh, emotionally, whether they think I'm a good candidate. So there's no overall requirement and a lot of people say, oh, it's a service dog. I have this letter from my doctor. Well, the doctors, as this person mentioned, don't know the service dog world. And so it, it really means nothing. It also means nothing when someone says, I have a certified service dog. Well, get on Amazon, send in your 50 bucks, and get a fake certification. So number one, that's a scam. Don't do it. And number two, it says nothing. And there's no requirement. So it really is buyer beware out there. And I will tell you, if you want to know whether a dog is a service dog, watch their behavior. Are they running up to people? Are they barking? Are they that kind of thing? Um, so 
The answer is no, but you might be asked for that if you go to an agency. So that kind of, so um, looking at going into a hospital for like infusions and surgery and things like this, um, a therapist writing a letter so your dog can come in. So that is going to be at the goodwill of the hospital. Um, and a lot of hospitals will do that, will let you bring an animal in. When I go into the hospital, I have pictures of my dog beside me on my bed. I have pictures of my dog in an ambulance riding with me. They're, they cannot separate me unless I cannot take care of my animal. So if I'm in the hospital and unconscious and unable to care for my dog, then they can place the dog somewhere that they're being cared for. But if I go into the hospital, unless I'm in the ICU or like a burn unit where you know it has to be sterile, my dog can be with me as long as I'm arranging for their care. But as far as like bringing an animal in for surgery and it not being a service dog, supporting documentation um, will help, but it doesn't like s make the dog a service dog. So it would be up to the hospital. Yeah. Anything else? Michelle, could somebody come up and pet your dog or ask to pet your service dog? Okay, so ask eight people and you'll get eight answers, kind of. But what, what we will say is the general rule is ask first. Some of us are okay with that. Um, I will say I had a previous service dog who was like a Labradoodle from Joke, Joke City. I mean, he wanted to engage with everybody and he loved people petting him and saying hi. Now I have Theo who I've decided is an introvert and he likes people, but kind of one-on-one, -on -one, not in crowds. So when you ask me now, two years ago you asked me, and I said, yeah, pet Hayden, and here he is. Now you ask me, and I'll say, you know, he'll, he's really kind of overwhelmed right now. Or I may just say no. But it's not about you, it's not about me being a bad person, it's what my dog needs in that moment. But I would say, always ask if you're interested, it's okay to ask. I would encourage you with guide dogs, probably skip it. Um, their dogs, wouldn't you say, are, yeah. are, are really watching out for things all the time. Whereas my dog, when we're walking, and he's helping me, but he doesn't need to be on as much as a guide dog. So definitely you can always ask, but don't be offended if someone says no. You may be the 30th person who's asked me and I'm exhausted, I just want to get home. And I say no, and it's not about you. It's about me or my dog. And it can be disruptive to the dog's work, yeah. right? That's yeah. the whole point of having a service dog is having their ability to help the person who they're with. So always ask. Some people really enjoy the social aspect that a service dog can bring to them. Um, and other per people might not enjoy you know, being asked um, for a pet. So you can always ask. Yep, I think that was the biggest take home. Yeah. Ask before petting. <laughs> well, and it's like if you guys are furries and you're walking out in your costume, you don't just walk down the street, you have attention, right? You don't get a free pass. So when I walk with my dog, I'm not just a human being walking into an office right? I've, I've got something unusual, so it almost begs interaction, and, and it can be quite disruptive. Not to equate it to furries, sorry <laughs> if I've offended. <laughs> I mean that lovingly, so. Oh. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so yes, so you'll hear things such as guide dog, service dog, assistance dog. I would say all of those terms are correct. Service dog is kind of an umbrella and can include guide dogs. 
A service dog means a dog that is in service of a person with a disability. And that disability can be anything. Um, we use assistance dog and service dog interchangeably. So, but, um, you know, we asked about a dog in a shopping cart. And um, a lot of times people will see like little chihuahua buddy in someone's front pack and, and just roll their eyes and say, oh yeah, that's a service dog, right? Well, actually they could be. They could also be a fake service dog, but they could be. They could be a diabetic service dog. They could be an epileptic seizure response or alert dog. They could be a, a psychiatric service dog. So you can't always t tell by the visual of the dog. You should be able to tell by the dog's behavior and the handler's behavior. So if I'm putting little Fifi in the shopping cart, that's a no-no. And if you have a service dog, you know that. So, yeah. Yeah. So the question is about uh, what they wear, vests, harnesses, that kind of thing, and if they look more professional. So we let all of our clients know you are not required to use identifying information on your service dog. That's not a, a, a federal mandate. And that's because if I'm living in the middle of Iowa and I self-train my dog and I don't have a lot of resources financially, it's not fair to ask me to spend a lot of money to get the help I need to go about my day. But I will say that with Summit, we do ask our clients if they can to give businesses a break and wear the vest and it shows that they're working also. It's a professional image. Um, but we have had dogs that don't like gear. Will you talk about that? Right, so there are um, circumstances where a dog is looking really good as a service dog. It can go through environments fine and be calm and comfortable, but it just for whatever reason doesn't like um, some of the gear that it's put on it. Um, or it will start um, restricting some of its movements if we put the gear on it. Um, in those cases, we, we would just help the client understand, like, you still have a, a dog who is trained to help you with your disability. They don't have to wear um, particular gear. Or we'll, we might come up with something like a bandana that it, it's just a little piece of information that might have, like, Summit Assistance Dog's badge attached to the bandana. Um, but it's not going full body. And so we try to work with that dog and find ways that help the dog be comfortable and remain comfortable during service work. So um, also a reason why it's not required to have um, your dog ID'd um, particularly because some dogs are really excellent service dogs um, it, besides having to wear gear. So are you gonna show some of Theo's gear? Cool. So, um, as I said, Theo is a balanced dog, and the harness I use is similar to a guide dog harness. Um, so, this goes on his back, this is on his chest. I'll actually gear him up while you're talking. Um, but for me, because I'm ambulatory, I walk, a lot of people assume that I don't need a service dog and that my dog is not a real service dog. When I put this on, it screams, this dog is doing something. Um, I still get a lot of challenges. We call them access challenges where people say, you can't bring your pet in here. Um, but I know the routine and I know what they can ask and I, I always give them the information. Um, but wearing something like this, my dog wearing it, not me, um, gives the business a benefit of the doubt also and to me communicates that this dog is doing something as well as the harness helps me. So I'll, I'll gear him up while you guys keep talking with Lindy. Oh, I get two. No. <laughs> um, additional questions? Yes. Oh my, yes. You will never watch um, those 
funny YouTube videos going around um, the same way ever again once you learn how to um, read dog body language. And you will never watch dog commercials the same way again. You will never watch dog movies the same way again once you learn dog body language. Um, and you would, some people kind of pick up dog body language from living with dogs. Um, but it is shocking how often people misinterpret dog body language um, and think the dog is happy or comfortable or just being silly, but um, the dog might be showing severe signs of distress. So um, up here, I could point out some, I mean, it's, it's so excellent of a question because I love um, having people have the ability to read dog body language because then we can learn how to respect the dog um, and respect their space. So the first thing people go to is the tail. Oh, if the tail's wagging, the dog is happy. So that is not always the case. <laughs> He's gonna go see his friend. <laughs> so in Theo's case, I would say Theo is happy um, because it is wagging at a regular kind of pace back and forth and at his regular carriage, his regular tail carriage. Sometimes if a tail's really up high and wet the, just the top of it's wagging, that means the dog is very excited or possibly stressed. Or if the tail is held really down low and wagging really slowly, it could mean the dog is um, also stressed. So uh, just a wagging tail cannot give you all the information about how a dog is feeling. Okay. Um, we'll wrap. Um, So Theo wears this every day. He also wears a gentle lead on his face. And people say, oh, your dog has to be muzzled. No, a gentle lead is like a horse lead. So if he turns his head and wants to go a different way, the gentle lead just reminds him that I'm on this side. But Theo wears this. And it helps me, like I said, when we go downstairs, I can tell. I'll show you what Lindy trained him to do. Here, buddy. <laughs> 